It's my privilege uh, to be here. I used to live in Livingston for a while and never came out to the wild areas around <laughs> like Oxford. Um, it's this is such a strange subject um, and yet so relevant. So many people didn't see this coming and some did. And a while ago, uh, I actually did a podcast at the beginning of the year and I was asked what, was the, what did I think would be the coming trend. And this was five years ago and I said, I think transgender. And people burst out laughing. Is this on? I need to switch on. Okay. That does help, doesn't it? So, where does it go switch on? Just to sit there. Is that it? Yeah. That's it. It's got you. Okay, good. So I don't have to share it to you. Um, <laughs> And I suggested that, amongst other things, women's sport would be in danger. And I showed a picture of the Iranian women's football team, eight of whom had beards. Uh, you may think, Iran? How? Iran, up until recently, was the number one country for uh, transgender surgery. Why? Because they hate homosexuals. And if you were homosexual, they said, well, maybe you're just a woman. It's just utterly, utterly bizarre. And I once got in trouble, almost got sued, for suggesting that when Andy Murray stopped winning at Wimbledon, he could just change his name to Andrina and he'd win the women's Wimbledon quite easily. And I was accused of being all kinds of things with that. And I, I never ever thought we'd get to the stage where this week I was sent a photograph of a, a, an American athletics uh, meet for a university in which the three women who won the women's 200 meter were all men. You know, quite, quite, quite extraordinary what's happening. Nor did I ever think I'd be in a situation where I was going to the Scottish Parliament and my allies were the radical feminists. Um, so it's great to be on side with the radical feminists. You think, well, where is all this going? This is just madness, madness, madness in so many ways. And you think, well, what's the relevance of this? Well, let's just take the, the Dundee Courier, which I'm sure you all read uh, yesterday had a story of a man in Fife who was convicted, imprisoned for rape, severe rape, as if it could be unsevere, but, and uh, released, and guess where he was placed? In a women's hostel, because he said he was a woman, with a shared bathrooms and everything. You know, I mean, that's, you think nobody in their right mind does that, but we're not in our right mind. So that's the kind of thing that happens. Or, Think of the seven-year-old girl in my congregation who came back uh, to her parents and burst into tears and amongst what's wrong. My, my boy or a girl? Sorry? What do you mean if you're a boy or a girl? You're a girl. Well, because teacher says, I can choose. Now, I regard that as child abuse. And, and there are lots of variations of that. Or, and maybe, maybe this is just because of a lot of the stuff I've done, but I, I do receive a lot of material. So I think possibly the favorite opening line of an email I've ever received was uh, a couple of months ago, a line that began, Hi David, I'm an ex-Mormon lesbian, and me and my girlfriends love you. <laughs> okay, uh, this is interesting. This is not a line you get every day. And so I went and met up with this lady, and it turns out that between the ages of 14 and 16, she was transgender, she said, I would like to tell my story. And so I've let her do it on a blog that I do, I've let her tell that story. Uh, you talk about damage, she, I'll just tell you what she herself said about how she was severely abused, raped as a child, um, decided when she was 14 that she was a boy, decided when she was 16 that, actually, what am I doing? I don't want need surgery, I'm, I'm a woman, what's wrong with being a woman? And then received the most horrific abuse, death threats, everything, moved house, changed name, because, inverted commas, she'd upset the transgender community. Now, I've occasionally in my life upset one or two people, and I hope to upset none of you here, but, or on the other hand, I hope to upset all of you so you can claim equality, uh, but <laughs> I've occasionally in my life upset people, and I always say, you know, you be very, very careful who you upset, especially online. Um, I'm not being political, but cybernats, Christian Zionists, and above all, transgender activists. 
are really scary. Really, really scary. I know plenty of politicians who are absolutely terrified. And when I go later this afternoon to, to the Scottish Parliament, that's one of the issues that we're going to look at. Now, the danger is, as Christians, when we look at these issues, we always respond to the world's agenda. And we mustn't do that. Because, basically, the world's agenda is wrong. They're not getting the right picture. The other thing is, we also respond to the extremes. Uh, and again, that's also not good. So what I want to do is, I want to take the opportunity to uh, look at the kind of big picture, because I think this is big picture stuff. Why is this so important? Why are people so fanatical about it? And why, we're not talking about ordinary people, but why have the cultural elites in our society generally bought into this in such a big way that I doubt by the end of this year, every single soap opera, every child in Scotland is going to be told that you can choose your own gender. You know, it's breathtaking. And the church has been appallingly culpable in, in reacting to this. In many instances, it's actually the church that has caused so much harm. So, I also want to, as a caveat at the beginning, is to say, remember we are dealing with real people. So I find this, when I write something, people will write, for example, on this issue, a transgender professor wrote me, and basically, to cut her email short, dear David, I hate you, uh, is kind of the lines along which it was going, and I disagree with you and all that kind of stuff. And I said, no, no, we don't do this by email, let's meet up. So we went and we had a two hour coffee together, and at the end of it, she said to me, do you know this? You're not nearly as evil as they say you are, <laughs> which, is, which is the first thing. And uh, then she made this astonishing thing. She said, I agree with 95% of what you're saying. And you see, we were able to talk about things in a much wider context. So you're going to be dealing with individual people. One other thing I will say in terms of the church. In my church, and I hope in your church, People who are transgender, people who are gay, and so on, are welcome, the same as every other sinner. But it's an absolute error to say that Jesus says, I welcome you just as you are, and affirm you just as you are. Jesus tells us to come, but we are to be changed, and radically changed, all of us. And please, by the way, do not think that people who I identify as transgender or uh, are very confused and messed up with this ideology are any worse sinners than the rest of us. Uh, that is, that's an appalling theology which I'm sure none of you would have. So, we're dealing with individual situations and there are many of them and maybe I'll come back to that. In terms of the bigger picture, there's a narrative that 21st century liberal humanism tells. And by the way, when we say liberal humanism, how we use words is very important. First of all, it's not liberal. It's very tight and very strict. Um, I am within, I, I expect, within my lifetime to be jailed for teaching the Bible because that's the direction that we're going. And I'm not being melodramatic, I just think that's the way it is. I've been threatened several times already. Um, it's not liberal. And also, this is the one that really annoys them. It's not human. Or at least it's not proper humanism. Uh, John Calvin was a humanist, but a humanist, you see, if you, I once had a debate with the president of the British Humanist Society, and he was very, very posh, and very, very calm and collected, until I suggested to him that he wasn't a proper humanist, and then he went ballistic, um, <laughs> because he missed out the spiritual dimension. But there is this narrative that 21st century liberal humanism says, um, and here's a gentleman called Dermot McCulloch, who professes to be a Christian, a professor at the University of Oxford, and he says simply this, I think religion has got everything appallingly wrong, uh, and, and it's been terrible for us in sexual terms. Now, the BBC commissioned a series for him entitled On Sex and the Church. Again, let me just throw it a wee aside here. I had a discussion with a BBC producer recently, and he said to me this, David, in the BBC we don't do diversity. He said, our idea of diversity is to have you know, a black person from Edinburgh and a white woman from Bergen in Glasgow, whatever. We say that's diversity, or different sexualities, that's diversity. But they all think the same thing. 
And what he was trying to do, he was trying to get me involved with him. And I said, well, well, well would I be allowed to be involved? And he said, well, you should be, because he said, I think your view is representative of at least 50% of the people in Scotland. But it's just not done on the BBC. And this idea of sex and the church, well, I've got an idea for the BBC. Let's ask Nigel at the back to a series on sex, sex and the church. Like, they don't. It's always, you know what that's going to be. So, even, but even I was a little bit astonished by Dermot McCulloch's position, which goes like this, and it, this is a position that would commonly be held in academia. But before Christianity came on the scene, sex was a pleasure, and which people enjoyed in the Greco-Roman pagan paradise. But then along came Christianity, and uh, basically repressed. So you, you, you're part of a repressed society. If you're Catholic, you're really repressed. If you're Calvinist, you're really repressed. If you're charismatic, you should be repressed. No, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> there's a kind of, you know, the, the attitude, right, you know, so you're repressed. And, and there was a, a woman called Margaret Mead who produced a book called um, Coming of Age in Samoa. And still to this day, it's seen as a classic text for which uh, sociologists would use to teach. And Margaret Mead had this idea, look, there are these wonderful savages uh, running around naked and having sex, and by the way, child sex as well, which is, is, is out at the moment in our culture, but just at the moment. And this is what we should be. We, want, we need to be free, and we need to be, you know, it, it, it's like an appetite. So I drive down here, and I will confess this, uh, just knowing that my wife never listens or looks at anything I do, so that's fine. Uh, as I drove past McDonald's, I thought, you know, there's some McDonald's breakfast, wouldn't go in this. So that's what I did. A sausage egg and cheese bagel, hash brown, and a flat white. Can't beat it. And uh, that's, that's what you do. Someone else would say, well, I fancy something else. That's fine. Well, sex is treated like an appetite. And that is the view of sex. See, I'm not opposed at all to sex education in our schools. But the view of sex as sacred and as special, which is a Christian view, is not what's taught. What's taught is sex is an appetite. You're going to do it. You're going to indulge. Just make sure it's inverted commas safe. And this idea then is that all these Christians came along and just repressed people. You just repress, that's the problem. And that's been around for a long time. When I was a student at university, my flatmate came in, professing Christian, he'd been struggling with depression, went to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist said to him, do you know what you need to do? You need to go and get drunk and get laid. And that was the professional advice. Well, because you've been repressed. Well, McCullough goes on to say that uh, Augustine, Paul especially, they brought this repressive stuff in and then along came the Enlightenment and now finally we're breaking free from that and basically we're in a society where the fantasies and dreams of the late 1960s hippies, which was free love, man, everything's going to be great, are being worked out, except they're being worked out at the expense especially of the poor. And it's creating havoc in our culture. Do I do a lot of camps with kids? One time I remember saying, oh boy, right, you need to go home and tell your dad this. Which one? What do you mean which one? Well, he says, I've got a Monday dad, a Tuesday dad, a Wednesday dad, a Thursday dad, a Friday dad. Different man can drink. What chance does that kid go? You know? It's just sex, it's just an appetite. You do it, that's it. Now, the attitude again is, what's wrong with having a smorgasbord of love? As long as we don't harm anyone, what's the problem? But I think that there's another bigger picture and a better picture. And there's a wonderful book I'd like to mention by Glenn Harrison called The Better Story. And that's what we've got to do. We, we cannot be the people who are constantly going, around, no, 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 no. We're teaching a better story. So, for example, in those camps, the first camp I ever did, Webster Simpson, who was a Church of Scotland elder and uh, died last year, an amazing man, he ran these camps, and the first camp I went to, I said, can Annabelle come with me? And he said, you're kidding. Please, please, please take her. And I said, why? Are you, are you that short of staff? He said, no, no. He said, the camp you're going to, 19 out of the 20 kids, won't have seen a positive male-female relationship. Stable one. And I thought he was joking, and he wasn't joking. You know, that, if, you, if we were talking about how we protect children and look after children, well, the family has always been the best means for that. But we're moving in a culture now where the state is seeking to replace the family. 
as I drove down here, I had to stop in and do a wee phone call with Radio Scotland, Cole K, who just can't, does not get it at all. She just doesn't get it. And it's about the police in Western Bartonshire are now going into schools and teaching um, children about domestic abuse and psychological domestic abuse. saying, well, don't you want that? And I said, well, I don't want the police doing it. For a start, it doesn't make any sense in lots of ways. A guy with a uniform standing saying, don't do something, is if I'm a teenager, it's going to make me want to do it. But that's not the issue. I said, for me, the issue is, when did the state become parents? And when did, don't do it, you know, there's something wrong, let's make a law and let's get the police to teach it. Where did this come from? You know, they talk about us being legalists, but modern, inverted commas, liberal society is incredibly authoritarian and legalistic. So, we are, that's their narrative, but we've got a different narrative, and I, I, I want to say something about this. What is humanity? Sonny, Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, in verse 4 especially. What is mankind that you're mindful of and human beings that you care for them? <clears throat> This whole story is about what is humanity? What is a human being? And you may say, well, come on, we, we know that. No, we don't, actually. And it's something we need to rethink. The two hardest questions, says Calvin, to, to answer are, who is God and who am I? And identity is the key word in this whole subject. So what is the identity of a human being? To the atheist philosopher Burton Russell, you're a blob of carbon floating from one meaningless existence to another. And if you are that, then if you kill someone, all you're doing is moving carbon around. The logical consequences of the atheistic view of humanity is hell on earth. But the Christian view is very different. So, um, one very militant gay activist once said to me, David, why do you, how come you disagree with me so much? And yet you treat me with such respect. And I said, well, because I don't look upon you as gay. I'm sorry if that offends you, but here's, here's the identity. I think, first of all, you're a human being. And that means that you're somebody who's made in the image of God. And that's everybody. Whereas the liberal humanist narrative doesn't have that. So I walk out of this building. Not, I'm sure this doesn't happen here. But if I walk out of this building, there's a guy lying in his own urine because he's so drunk. Most normal reaction is, what, an idiot? Scum. But he's a human being made in the image of God. And that's a burden to bear for a Christian because we weep at what is happening. What is Man is a title of an essay by Martin Luther King published in 1959, which I think was brilliant, and argued that uh, humanity is more than an animal and less than God. Now here's the key thing in this. When we cease to believe in God, this is G.K. Chesterton's argument, I think it's superb. When we cease to believe in God, it's not just that we lose the sense of, sense of the divine, but we lose humanity. And that is what is happening in Scotland today. That we're losing the sense of the human. Now, forgive me as a Presbyterian for quoting the short catechism. How did God create man? God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, with dominion over the creature. And that's why this issue is so important. Because what the, if any of you are into the Russian writers like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, they, they, they brilliantly, brilliantly thought through things and asked lots and lots of questions. And they saw that the destruction of Western society would come about if three things were removed. One was private property, the other was the church, and the third was the family. But not even they saw this. Right at the beginning, God created the male and female. What is happening now in our culture, it is the devil's attempt to deconstruct humanity. Now I've used the phrase demonic, and I got in so much trouble with this. And this is how, and it was a, a, a senior clergyman who reported me to the press and the press came and had a real go at me in March of last year. Uh, so much so, this is, how, this is how ingrained this has become that my daughter who's a student at Edinburgh University was visited by her lecturers and asked to disown me. That's illegal for them to do that. But it doesn't matter. That's, you can't. 
You can't. You can't. But I think this is where this is going. Gender. We are created male and female. Now, because of the fall, there's dysfunction, there's lots of different things, and we need to think very carefully about what gender means, because there's a whole range of, 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 of different side issues that come here. You know, like, real men don't eat quiche, quiche and don't wash dishes. No, <laughs> that's not. That's not a sign of masculinity. Right? And it's the same. Um, we need to think carefully about what that means. But fundamentally, human beings are male and female. Identity. Our identity is found in God because we're made in the image of God. Marriage. We are created for one another. Now, again, you, there's lots of caveats spin off from that. I have a congregation which is 50% singles. You don't say because someone's not married that there's something wrong, and nor that... Do you, does you getting married bring you salvation? There are a lot of unhappy marriages. But nonetheless, we are created as social beings and we're created for one another. And society, we live in community and we live in society and we serve God and one another by following the Maker's instructions. And there's a caveat here as well. It is absolutely sinful and absolutely immoral and absolutely wrong for any Christian to say, well, I don't care what other people think as long as I have my beliefs. My concern with the transgender issue is not the church. I'm protecting the rights of the church. My concern is the people of Scotland, who used to be known as the people of the book, and who are being fed poison in ideology. And we should be concerned about them. That's what should be our primary concern. Now, what happens, of course, in Christian theology, uh, our understanding is there was a fall, and that, first of all, disturbs our most basic relationships, Adam and Eve. Straight away, conflict introduced. But that fallout affects the environment, affects society, and affects our relationship with one another and with God. Humanity before the fall lived to do the will of God. After the fall, we are autonomous and seek to be God. So again, in our culture, that's the big thing. You can be whoever you want to be. There's a lady from Fife, a young woman from Fife, who stood up at the SNP conference three years ago and announced I'm 80% female and 20% male and she got a standing ovation. Nobody had the nerve to stand up and say, don't be stupid, you're not 20% male. That's not how it works. But nonetheless, it was just, oh, I, I can be whoever I want to be. Now that's what they say. Now if you take that, that, that becomes really, really ridiculous. And what's going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment, by the way, is really ridiculous. Because the Scottish Government are proposing that you can self-identify as whoever you want. Without any medical, without having lived as strength. So, you know, let's say I decided, you know, this, I've had enough of the ministry, I want to become a, a, a member of Parliament. SNP are quite popular, I'll go in for them, and uh, they say, oh, we're sorry, David, but uh, we do gender quotas now, and uh, it's 50% female, 50% male, and the 50% male is gone, and I just simply say, well, that's okay, I'm female. I'll sign the form in the post office. Legally, there's nothing they can do about that. I mean, that's the madness of it all. But that's where we are heading. We're autonomous, we can be whatever we want to be. Here's the thing, no, we can't. The motto of our culture is, I believe I can fly, I believe I can touch the sky. Okay? Jump out of a four-story building and see what happens, how that flying is going. You can't fly, I'm sorry, you can't be whoever you want to be. That's just not, that's not how life is. And telling our kids that, by the way, is just ridiculous. Like my daughter came home from school one day and she was only eight years old and she said, Dad, I got in trouble. I said, oh, okay, tell me what you do. So I was answering back to the teacher. I said, oh, no, come on, I've told your pet, don't do that. She said, no, 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 Dad. I said, what did you say? She said, well, the teacher said, everyone's special. We're all special. Uh-huh. I said, what did you say? Well, I put my hand up. And I said, please, miss, if we're all special, then no one's special. And I went, that's my girl. <laughs> I said, how dare you think? You know. You know, you just, you just think, come on, guys. You know, the Christian can argue, by the way, for equality and for being unique and special because we're all made in the image of God. But the non-Christian has no basis for that. How does a non-Christian get equality, by the way? What do they mean by it? I can't run as fast as you say, Bolt. I don't have the brains of, I don't know, 
something really brainy, <laughs> like all of you. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have those brains. Um, I get up in the morning and I might think I'm Brad Pitt, but if I look in the mirror, that soon disabuses me of that particular uh, notion. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't just be whoever I want to be. And, and I'm not equal, except this. Everyone is equally made in the image of God. Knowledge, righteousness, and the holiness. Now, what, what's all this got to do with this? Well, sorry, gender identity, marriage, and society. Let's look at the fall in terms of sexuality. Um, Smyrna had an advert, 2015. By the way, one of the things you need to be really careful of, all the big corporations have been bought over by this ideology. And they all want to show that they can do it. Why? The police even will have rainbow colored cars. Why? Because it costs them nothing. It's the ultimate in virtue signaling. Oh, look how liberal and nice we are. But you, you see this all the time. So Smirnoff, for example, heterosexual, sexual, who gives a sexuality? That was their advert in 2015. Now here's the important thing to grasp. The idea of sexuality as an identity is a new thing. This is not something that has existed throughout human history. It stems from the 19th century and particularly the work of Freud. Now there's practical implications of this. So someone will come walk up to me, and this has happened a few times. Hi David, I'm so and so and I'm gay. And I go, I'm David. And I'm not, so I guess we're never gonna get it off. They look, what? I said, well, I said, why did you say that? Why is that your identity? Oh, it's 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 it's, it's no. No, it's not. My identity is not that I'm heterosexual, primarily. That's not primarily my identity. Now, the initial reason for accepting the idea of sexuality as an identity is to say that people were born that way. And ironically, again, it's many within the church who push this. So they say, what could be wrong if God made me this way? Well, my daughter's a, a redhead. And in my experience, and I apologize, I'm looking around very, very quickly. Uh, my experience, redheads do have quite a temper. <laughs> Not always, but imagine if you say, I can't help it, God made me that way. I've dealt in my ministry many times with people who, there does seem to be a genetic component to their alcoholism. I can't help it, God made me that way. Former Bishop of Edinburgh, Richard Holloway, said that all men were predisposed to sow their oats with as many people as possible. Fine, we can be as promiscuous as we want because God made me that way. No, no, you can't say that. That's, we, we cannot turn around and somewhat childishly blame God for every default in human nature. I think the notion of a fixed sexuality is now being challenged bizarrely more and more by those advocating gay rights. We're now getting to a position where people get to choose their own sexuality. So the Daily Telegraph of all newspapers two years ago carried an article in which it said there isn't a single woman in Britain who's heterosexual. Completely. There you go, ladies. You're, you're, you're a bit surprised. Um, unbelievable. Even when my uh, 15 years ago, when my daughter was in secondary school, when my daughter was in secondary school, she came home from school and she told me, Dad, that most people in her class identified as bisexual. Why? See, when you see those figures, by the way, for, for LGBT, it's less than one percent of women are heterosexual or homosexual or lesbian, and just over one percent of men. But it's this bisexual if you've had, and someone like Peter Tatchell will argue that sexuality is fluid. Now it's, it's, it's very, very ironic in that way. Um, by the way, when I go to school and speak, I'll ask the kids, how many people do you think are homosexual? You know what I'll say? Between 10 and 30%. Because the Kinsey Report, which many of you will have heard about, was a complete farce. Completely false, completely debunked, but it's the basis on which government policy has been based for the past five decades. And that is that one in 10 people are homosexual. No, they're not. It's one in 100. And yet, government's policy has been based upon that. The understanding of sexual orientation as an innate, biologically fixed property of human beings, the idea that people are born that way, is not supported by scientific evidence. That's the first thing. Whilst there is evidence that genes and hormones are associated with sexual behaviors and attractions, there are no compelling 
causal biological explanation for human sexual orientation. In other words, there isn't a gay gene. I know some radical gay activists who are immensely thankful for that because they think if there was a gay gene, then there could be genetic engineering and so on. Minor differences in the brain structures and brain activity between homosexual and heterosexual individuals have been identified by researchers, but they do not indicate whether these are innate or whether they're caused by environmental circumstances. Overall, longitudinal studies of adolescents suggest that sexual orientation may be quite fluid. Isn't it interesting that the big fuss just now, the absolute crime, and the Church of England have announced this as a sin. They, 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 they don't believe they're not believing in the resurrection as a sin, but believing in conversion therapy is a sin. Well, why, why is this big fuss about conversion therapy? Let me just be a little bit careful here. What do you mean by conversion step therapy? What they do, and this is always the case, they'll take the most extreme. So people are raped in order to make them, you know, change sexual orientation. Well, that's obviously sinful, abusive, criminal, ridiculous. But they always take the ridiculous as the uh, as the norm. But what they're saying is, we can't change. We can't change our identity. So I had a little um, bust in on Sunday on talk radio with John Nicholson, the former SNP MP, who has his own show on talk radio. Now again, I'm not making a political point. Um, uh, if I was, I was very supportive of the SNP. But Mr. Nicholson is, I'm afraid, Joe Swinson's analysis of him was correct. It's an absolutely horrible character. And he came on and he wanted to attack and abuse and mock and so on. And I, I just said to him, if we're going to teach kids what someone's experience is, what about the experience of someone who used to be gay and is no longer? That doesn't exist. He said, well, I'm sorry. I said, I can tell you several people for whom that is the case. No, 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 that can't be the case. I said, no, well, but it is the case. By the way, and then he got quite bizarre because he said, have you ever wondered why your church is in decline? which I'm not quite sure if that had to do with the discussion. Uh, quite a, first of all, my church is not in decline. So, sorry. That's just the, the way it is. But, I think that um, you find that as many as 80% of male adolescents who report same-sex attractions no longer do so as adults. That is why it's insane to tell children that they are gay. You can have, I, I, I personally do believe there are people who are same-sex attracted, there are people in my congregation who are same-sex attracted, and who've decided to live as faithful Christians. I know ministers who are like, I, don't, I do not see a problem with that at all. But I do see an enormous problem with schools encouraging children to self-identify. And that, this goes to the transgender issue as well, by the way. Let me just give you one example. These are real examples of real people. I get a phone call one day. It's a woman who is not very wise because she often disagrees with me. You know, so I think, oh, okay, come on, what's going on here? I said, why are you for? I said, I'm ready. You know, you, you kind of hold the phone. And you think, okay, here goes. Be polite. Remember, you're a Christian. Don't yell back. And, and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, okay, yes. What have I done now? No, no, you haven't done anything. What is it? It's my son, 14 years old. Yes, I don't know your son. Well, he came home from school, and he tells me that he's a girl. I said, whoa, what's wrong with that? You, you shout at me for daring to question the whole transgender ideology. Oh, no, she's, but he's not, he's not. I said, yeah, uh -huh. chickens come home to roost. It's very different, isn't it, in theory. But I said, well, well, tell me the story. You tell me the story. <coughs> My son suffers from depression. He goes to school. He goes to the guidance teacher. Uh-huh. Tells the guidance teacher he's depressed. Uh-huh. The guidance teacher said, maybe it's because you're a woman trapped in the wrong body. <laughs> I said, that's absolutely outrageous. She said, I know, I'm fizzing. And I said, but do you know why the guidance teacher did that? He said, no. I said, I'll tell you why. I know the school. The school's trying to get a Stonewall Award for being LGBT friendly. They don't have any T pupils. So they're wanting to have some. Words going around. The guidance teacher, if he has an LGBT pupil in his class, kudos for him. That's why. And if you think that's a unique story, that was Dundee. I can tell you the same story from the borders. I can tell you the same story from Orkney. Because Stonewall 
sponsored by the Scottish Government, are trying to give schools awards for this kind of thing. So again in Dundee, in a primary school in Dundee, we have a class which on every wall for six and seven year olds, there's a poster that says respect people's pronouns. Now I'm sorry, most adults in Dundee don't know what a pronoun is. Never mind six and seven year olds. But that's the kind of level of indoctrination. So I want to share with you this, this quote from Peter Tatchell. I debate Peter Tatchell, the gay activist. I think he's remarkably consistent. In some ways, I have some admiration for him. In other ways, he's one of the most evil people I've ever met. And that is because, um, although he will not admit it, his position is effectively that of pedophilia. Now, he will deny that, but I've debated it through with him, and I think that there's... This is what he says. I think this is very, very important. Overcoming homophobia will result in more people having gay sex, but fewer people claim gay identity. See, it's only about sex. The medieval Catholic Church, despite all its obscurantism and intolerance, got one thing right. Homosexuality is not, it suggested, the special sin of a unique class of people, but it's a temptation to which any mortal may succumb. It now seems fairly certain in the light of modern research that most people are born with a sexual desire that is to varying degrees capable of both heterosexual and homosexual attraction. Once homophobia declines, we are bound to witness the emergence of a homosexuality that is quite different from the homosexuality we know today. With the strictures on queerness removed and same-sex relationships normalized and accepted, more people will have gay sex, but paradoxically, less of them will identify as gay. This is because in the absence of homophobia, the need to assert gayness becomes redundant. Gay identity is the product of anti-gay repression. When homosexuality is discouraged and victimized, gay people understandably feel they have to affirm their desires and lifestyle. However, if prejudice is vanquished, and if one sexuality is not privileged over another, Defining oneself as gay or straight will cease to be necessary and have no social significance. The need to maintain sexual differences and boundaries disappears with the demise of straight supremacism. Homosexuality is a separate, exclusive, clearly demarcated, demarcated orientation identity will then begin to fade, as will its mirror opposite heterosexuality. Instead, the vast majority of people will be open to the possibility of both opposite sex and same-sex relations. They won't feel the need to label themselves or others as gay or straight because in a non-homophobic culture, no one will give a damn about who loves and lusts after who. Now that is highly significant because that's basically saying we're going to be like the wildest animals and, I'm sorry for using this expression, but I was brought up on a, brought up on a farm, just rut like rabbits, you know. So you sleep with whoever you want, you do what, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. It's a smart enough advert. It doesn't matter. That is one of the most dreadful things that you can teach any teenager. And the consequences of that will really come home to roost in the next five to ten years. The dysfunctional families. You, you know, it's little wonder that mental illness amongst teenagers is absolutely sorry. Because this is the ideology of the culture. What harm does it do? Um, in terms of the fall, in terms of, of marriage... Um, now, I have a friend who recently wrote an article. Every single word of it absolutely true. And ironically, Patrick Harvey, leader of the Greens, who identifies as bisexual, uh, will argue that homosexuals need more medical care because there are more illnesses. And my friend wrote this article about the number of diseases associated with homosexual practice. And there's not a newspaper in the country will publish it. Not because it's not true. Not because it's empirically false. You cannot prove it by science. Not because there isn't a research. But because they don't want to be sued. So there are truths you can't say. You know, and I, I feel this very passionately in lots of ways. Not least, again, in 27 years ministry in Dundee, I think of the, the male student who thought that he was gay and decided he would go to a gay party, very much against my advice. He ended up giving, university, giving up university because he was raped by a businessman. And you know what the police told him? You can't prove, prove gay rape. And I know that's not their position now. But it's just the whole lifestyle aspect. Now that's not saying, please do not make the mistake of saying that all homosexuals are promiscuous. But I'm saying that once you remove God's standards around sex and sexuality, then yes, anything does go. And don't be surprised if people live that out. And by the way, in terms of the fall as well, 
please, I hope nobody here is stupid enough to, to say, well, somehow uh, gay sex is wrong, but heterosexual adultery is not so bad. Yes, it is. It's absolutely, it's, it's really wrong of a church to excuse one sin and justify another or condemn another. So in terms of marriage, the important thing here, people like Peter Tatchell for decades have sought to destroy marriage. He wrote in 2005 in The Observer an article that any gay activist who supported marriage was a traitor. And within 10 years, he's arguing for same-sex marriage. Why? This is an absolute key. Same-sex marriage is not marriage. My position is very simple. I don't recognize that it exists. There are civil partnerships, there are same-sex relationships, but they are not marriage. And when I wrote to the uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, when all this was going through, I got a letter back from his office and it actually said this, we are seeking to redefine marriage for everyone. Now that's what they did. They've taken away the covenantal idea of marriage and turned it into a civil contract. And it is, it is very, very destructive of marriage. Incidentally, I think that one of the, by far the, the bigger threat to marriage has been um, the acceptance of casual sexual relationships and so on. I mean, because of the internet, I don't know why I've been targeted for this, but over the past two weeks, I've been getting regular adverts from Ashley Madison. You don't want to know who they are. Because basically, they're, they're offering me women who are married to have affairs with. It's, it's all perfectly legal. We're a society that's prostituted itself. And marriage is being destroyed because of that. I think, but though, the reality of marriage the redefinition of marriage is part of a wider philosophy which seeks to redefine humanity and create a world in which we choose our own sexuality and our own gender because ultimately they do not matter. In the beginning God created the male and female. In the end, man or humanity creates as transhuman. We have time to come on to that. The fall in terms of gender. This uh, young lady is from not too far from here became very, very famous when the BBC put a video out that she made, a very creative and very sharp video about how she wasn't male, she wasn't female, she was bi-gender and all the rest of it. Very mocking of religion, very assertive. <coughs> so I hope that this is going to the new BBC channel. About four months ago they asked, would I come through and do a programme in Glasgow with them? I said, what, what is it? And they said it's uh, called Shake On It. And um, I was told you would come and record for two hours, but it will be a five minute program. So that's always a bad sign, because you know they can edit, they can make you say whatever they want, you know. So I thought, okay. Uh, but it was very clever, I went in, they didn't tell you who you were supposed to be discussing with. The idea is you argue with somebody who you strongly oppose, and at the end, will you shake on it? Now I knew it was going to be trans something, because that's... I had this vague suspicion. So they come in, they do an interview with you, and then you go into the studio, you sit down, and there's all these ch tables with various drinks, and so we experiment to see what drink you would offer each other and all. And then you have, they've got a, you've got a list of questions you ask each other. And in walked uh, this young lady, and I, I knew straight away, I thought, oh, of course it's going to be. So we started discussing. Now, just to give you some idea of what went on there, um, they say, you know how they say things don't change? Well, now she's saying that she's actually a he. Um, but, here's the interesting one, uh, a homosexual he. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. It's totally, you, you try and keep your head around where all of this is going, and it's bizarre. But I had a really, 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 really good conversation, and afterwards, we used to say to me, do it. That's, one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Will you shake on it? I said, no, I won't shake on it. Come on, give me a hug. You know? Because I said, look, you're a human being made in the image of God, and you're so messed up and confused. But, but the interesting thing was, she changed from bi to saying, well, now I'm male. Mm -hmm. And in two years' time, maybe something else. You know, just a mess. An absolute mess. But this poor girl was lauded as a heroine. 
and a great member of the trans community. I was like, you know, just, you think, come on. I tell you this, if and I hope when she becomes a believer and gets her life sorted out, all hell will break loose against her from her former friends. There's something deeply dark in this whole community. You are 20 times more likely to commit suicide as a trans person. And that's not because trans people are bullied. That may be a factor in some instances. But this destruction of gender is really important. Now, where is this coming from? See, gender does have to do with biology. You know, have, have you noticed how officialdom is now using language that doesn't make any sense? So I have a congregation that's full of nurses and doctors. And I have three grandchildren, and I've got another one on the way. And I will absolutely guarantee you that there is no midwife in Scotland ever who sees a baby pop out, and apologies ladies for the graphic language, um, they see a baby pop out or whatever, and they lift up the baby and they go, oh, I think we've had a few boys in this hospital, we can do with a girl, we'll just call this one a girl. No, you look, and you go, it's a girl, or it's a boy. And it's not just based on the genitals, that's the argument that's used. Every single chromosome in your body is male or female. It is incredibly dangerous to treat a man with female drugs that are more suitable for females, or the other way around. Incredibly dangerous. And you think, no, nah, come on. This, you know, this is not really happening. Yes, it is. I made a casual remark in a podcast once, along the lines of, um, we soon won't be able to use the term breastfeeding. And within half an hour, I got an email from the consultant of the largest maternity unit in the whole of Western Europe. He said, David, I know you were joking. But he said, I'm sitting here with a directive from the British Medical Association telling us not to use the term breastfeeding. We have to use the term chest feeding because there are two trans men who have artificial chests strapped to them and it would be discriminatory because they don't have breasts. And I'm, I'm thinking, first of all, the weirdest thought I had was, well, some of the men I know have breasts, or they look like it anyway. <laughs> um, could do a diet. But the, the, I just thought, you are joking me. And I said, can I use this? He says, you can't use my name because I lose my job. I thought, my goodness, what kind of society are we living in? But he said, you can use it. So I did use it. The BMA denied it. I phoned him up and said, look, I'm sorry. Were you winding me up? Were you setting me up? Because this does happen. Is this fake news? He said, David, the letter is in front of my desk. I've been instructed to tell my staff not to use the term breastfeeding. Boy or girl? No. Apparently you can't decide that. Apparently it's something that's within you. What you feel like. Well, you get all kinds of problems. What do you feel like a dragon? Does that make you a dragon? What do you feel like Napoleon? Here's the bizarrest thing in the world. That fact, well, I keep going, each week I keep going, it can't get any more bizarre. And then it does. So two weeks ago, New York announced that not only could you be fined a quarter of a million dollars for misgendering someone, and you, don't, you know what that is, that's giving them the wrong, saying he when it should be she or whatever, it's these or there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But, that if a uh, counsellor or psychotherapist seeks to treat somebody, a man who says that he's a woman, they can go to jail. But on the other hand, a man who says he's Napoleon, that's fine. <laughs> Where? Where's that all going? Now, there are lots of practical effects of that. Um, it, it's seen in, in, in lots of different ways. The UK Parliament, and this, this is important, I've watched, because I was, I was interested in this, I watched the first ever debate in the UK Parliament on transgender issues. Only 40 MPs turned up, virtually unreported in the newspapers the following day. Why? And then I realized why. Because most normal people go, this is insane. By normal people, I basically mean, in Dundee, hairdressers and taxi drivers, because <laughs> that's where I find out where the culture's really at. You know, and they just go, oh, come on. This is nuts, and it is nuts. And most parents are against it. But there were two people who stood up, one of them who's a conservative government minister, and they actually said this in that debate. They said, forget the adults, we have to go for the kids. And that's what they're doing. And that's what's <coughs> going through the Scottish Parliament just now. Despite considerable pushback. But you're getting the kids, you're telling them 
Now you think, oh, come on, that's, that's not happening. Yes, it is. So a friend of mine is doing an activity play in a school in Dundee, primary school. And she says, Mary was a pregnant woman. And this 10-year-old girl stands up and says, you can't say that. How do you know she was a woman? <laughs> that particular school has an LGBT committee made up of pupils. You're thinking, Chairman Mao's little red guards, that's what they like. They are to report on any homophobia or whatever. Nurseries in Scotland, a couple of weeks ago, were sent directives to try and not use terms boys and girls. You know, we're looking going, no, this is just loopy, this is just crazy. Yeah, but this is the norm that's coming in more and more. And that's, this is where this comes from. The harm in all of this, members of the transgender population are at a higher risk of a variety of mental health problems. Um, the suicide rate is absolutely massive. And here's a, another fascinating thing. Even after the surgery, that doesn't decrease. So a, a doctor phoned me up one day and said, David, I just want to tell you that you're right on the transgender stuff. That's what I do. I do transgender surgery. I'm stopping it. I'm giving it up. And I said, why? He said, because it has an 80% negative outcome, which for medical practice, 10% negative outcome is highly risky and we only do it if people's lives in danger but an 80% negative outcome is insane and yet Newcastle recently advertised for two, two transgender consultants but this guy was in Edinburgh and I said can I use your name he said no I lose my job that's where we're at it's an 80% negative outcome I said what does that mean he says they're worse off afterwards than they were before so you see what's going on here? The mind, because transgender does exist, there are people who do feel that maybe they're, they're you know, boys who feel that they're girls the other way around. But the mind is out of sync with the body, so what do we decide to do? We decide to mutilate the body and not deal with the mind. That just doesn't make any sense. But it gets um, a little bit worse than that. Oops, says here, if I can get this to come around. There's transgender, multigender. This is where your head really begins to hurt. Uh, male and female. <coughs> the last time I looked, uh, Facebook had now gone up to 87 different genders. So, you know, you work your way around all of it. It really is um, extraordinary. Michael Ballor, 1982, co opened Edinburgh's first lesbian and gay bookshop, Lavender Menace, uh, said that this is incredible what's happening in Scotland. Now we're the most progressive society in the world. The reason the Scottish Government will almost certainly pass their latest transgender stuff is because they've announced it to the world and they don't want to be seen to go back. Although I have yet to meet a single Scottish Government minister who actually believes it. It's, a, it's hypocrisy. By the way, we're a culture that's steeped in hypocrisy. <coughs> uh, I, I got to think of that yesterday. I'm sorry for being so gloomy, but I'm due to go into hospital and um, for an operation. And I get this wonderful letter that says, you are guaranteed your operation by the 12th of April. I'm going, oh, that's great. So I phone up the appointments, and the woman laughs, and she says, oh, just ignore that. The Scottish government tell us to send that out. It's utterly meaningless. I said, but it's a promise, it's a guarantee. She says, meaningless? It's like so many things. Meaningless, well, this is meaningless. Non-binary pronouns, um, let me, there you go, there's a list you need to memorize. So you thought in school, look what you missed. Yeah. Uh, you know, you do times table, here's your non-binary pronouns. So you can have hers, her, herself, hers, it's these, or you can have to be identified by any pronoun that you want to be. So the former education convener of Dundee City Council identifies himself as non-binary. Local newspapers have a nightmare. They always just say council or so and so. They don't use any pronouns because he gets really upset. Very nasty character. Gets involved with me on Twitter and starts flinging abuse. Uh, he got fired, by the way, not for abusing me, but when he decided to take on the feminists. Oh, that was the end. Uh, just don't take on feminists. I'm, I'm, I'm with the sisters on this one. And uh, he, But anyway, I said, he did this. And immediately I got this really angry tweet and threatening with suing and reporting me to the police for misgendering and so on. I said, well, what do you want to be called? Her? No, no. 
Okay, well, which one is it? I said, I, then I said to them, I will call you whatever you want. I said, I don't want a problem with that, I'll call you whatever you want. That's how you identify. On condition that you call me whatever I want. <coughs> okay? Well, I'm a Christian, and I self-identify as a Christian. That's my primary identity. So whenever you refer to me or address me, you must use the phrase, beloved in Christ. <laughs> occasionally, I'll let you use the term beloved. You know? I never heard from him again. Uh, although occasionally he does, he does stalk me. But that's where we've gone with, with this. Now, there are 31 protected gender identities in New York, and they will come here as well. You can be fined if you refuse to use the preferred pronoun. If you've heard of Jordan Peterson, that's what, why he got into so much trouble, because he refused to do that. Now again, biblically, if you know your Bible, what's happening here? It's not just that speech is being confused. It's that freedom of speech is being taken away. In our attempt to become as God, we are creating a new Tower of Babel where words become meaningless and we can't communicate with each other. People speak in slogans and jargon. Now, Christian jargon is awful, but this jargon is way beyond that. It's utterly meaningless in what it communicates. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just five minutes to have a wee toilet break or restroom break or whatever, and then we'll come back and we'll have, uh, I'm going to finish this off and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, some questions and comments as well. Okay, so take five minutes. <coughs> 